Good morning. This is the second part of my series on the wonderful novel by Ben Sass, The Vanishing American Adult, and our coming-of-age crisis and how to rebuild a culture of self-reliance is, in case you can't see that. I am going to read one part of it to you, and then I'm going to tell you how personally this affected me and how I realized that I was raised to be a perpetual adolescent, and, and still am, to be honest, in many ways, as many of you probably can tell from some of my Facebook posts. Okay, from the novel, um, actually it's, it's not a novel, it's a true story, but um, these seemingly disparate stories about lack of initiative, remember I told you about yesterday the Christmas tree and the air conditioning thing? These, similarly dis these seemingly disparate stories about lack of initiative and about the coddling that breeds softness and entitlement in kids from age 10 to 20-something are not in any way about politics. And yet the problems identified are problems not nearly for these particular kids and parents. This crisis of idleness and passive drift is profound for every citizen of this republic. For this nation is pre premised on the idea that the government exists not to define and secure the good, the true, and the beautiful, but rather to maintain a framework for ordered liberty so that free people can pursue their happiness in the diverse ways that they see fit. We need our emerging generations to become fully functioning American adults, providing for their families, investing in their communities, showing the ability to raise children who will carry on after them, paying taxes to help government function and fix our broken retirement system. We need curious, critical, engaged young people who can demonstrate, demonstrate initiative and innovation so the United States can compete with a growing list of economic, military, and technological rivals in the 21st century. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? And I'm here to tell you my own story, which um, I guess I shouldn't be proud of, but maybe it will help you understand why sometimes you see me on here ranting because the water got turned off, because I was inconvenienced in some way for a few hours, because the power goes out or my TV goes out. I freak. I lose my mind. If I have to wait more than five minutes at a doctor's office, I freak out. I don't stand in line at the grocery store. I get pissed. I lose my freaking mind. I have adult ADHD. Now, I don't know if the reason I have it is because as a child, I was pretty much not inconvenienced or refused to be inconvenienced because I knew how to work my mom. But it's interesting. The fact that I actually have chest pains if I have to wait in line or if I am not immediately given the satisfaction when something's broken or when I'm in a waiting room. I don't wait. I don't like to wait. I don't like to be inconvenienced. I don't like to sit in traffic. I actually get physically ill. How dare Paula Luciano have to wait in traffic? Like somehow I'm better than all the people behind me who are waiting in traffic. Let me tell you how I came to be this way. Reading this book is helping me figure it out. So first of all, one thing that Ben Sass says is, our children are coddled. Now, I wasn't, I was coddled to a point. I did not have a beautiful silver spoon, wealthy childhood. I did not. What I had was an unconventional childhood at the time. I was born in 1964. And because of circumstances, my grandfather passed away three months before I was born. My mother was still a newlywed. Yes, she was pregnant when she got married in June. And everybody gathered around my mother and basically said, you are now responsible for taking care of your mother because she's a widow. 
And that changed everything. <laughs> my mother, who had finally had her own apartment with my father and was looking forward to my birth, all of a sudden was back living under her mother's roof. Against her will, my mother wanted to be independent, wanted to have her own apartment, wanted to have her own house one day with my daddy. But that wasn't to be. And again, it's the same house I live in today with my husband. One bathroom and very little privacy for a newlywed couple expecting their first child. Living with an old woman, not that old, but a paranoid woman who wanted to control everything. And within three months after my birth, my father was gone. I was told many times over he was an alcoholic, he was a loser. Well, you know, by the time I was 10, I actually used to say if I had to live with my grandmother, I would have left too if I had the choice. In fact, I begged my mother many times, can we please just go get our own place, just you and me, mommy. Let's get rid of granny. <laughs> yeah. So, anywho, I knew from very early on, when I first went off to school, that I was different. Very different. All of my friends, first of all, they looked different than I did. They were thinner. And I was fat. And they made sure I knew. I knew that. Look at the little beached whale coming in. Look at Blimpy. Yeah. Um, I did not have a daddy. What does your daddy do? Oh, I don't have a daddy. Oh. Hey. Their mommies were home after school baking cookies and my mommy was at work. And I wasn't allowed to leave the house after I got home from school because my grandmother was afraid I was going to be kidnapped. So I was, you know, trapped. I used to go home from school and watch soap operas with my grandmother. And my mother worked, which I hated. So again, this is all going to... It sounds weird, but this is all going to get into how I became who I am and what happened later. So, um, as I got older and my grandmother got very sick and my mother was a wishbone, she had a young daughter to take care of, but she also had this duty that was put upon her by her uncles and aunts who, of course, didn't want to take care of their sister, my grandmother. They didn't have the time for it. It was her job as the only child, the daughter. She had to do it. So a lot of times, my grandmother came first, and I was second. I never went on a vacation, just me and my mom. Granny always had to come with, and usually ruined the whole thing because of her special needs and having to stop every 10 minutes to go to the bathroom, making a two-hour trip, a five-hour trip. Who drives from Lancaster to Wildwood in five hours? It's a two-and-a-half-hour trip. I've done it. But when I was a kid, it was a five-hour trip because we had to stop for breakfast, and then we had to stop for Granny to go to the bathroom. Everything was under my grandmother's control. So my mother ended up with some guilt, as she should have, actually. If I were her, I would have felt guilty because basically my grandmother's needs were met first. And because I was a child, everybody just assumed I would just be fine. The fact that I couldn't have friends to my home, the fact that I had didn't even have my own bedroom because my grandmother's room, the sick room, that stunk of urine and feces and nurses coming in and people coming to visit her, was connected to my room by nothing more than a curtain. It wasn't even a door. I, I couldn't even go to my bedroom for solace and privacy. I had no privacy as a child. So there was some guilt. When my grandmother went into the nursing home, it was my mother's duty because she was the first um, woman in our family to dare to put her elderly mother in a nursing home. And she got a lot of crap for that. I was so relieved the day my grandmother left our house, my house, the house my mother paid for, for 17 years of my life. I was thrilled, but my mother still had that duty. So my mother would go to work from 8 to 4.30, and at 4.30 she would go to the nursing home, 
and visit my grandmother like a dutiful daughter until 7.45 when visiting hours were over. So I did not see my mother from 8 o'clock in the morning when she left for work and I left for school until 8 o'clock that night because my grandmother came first because it was her duty. I was not her duty. So now I come of age, right? Well, first of all, during school, during my high school years, a lot of my friends had summer jobs. Now I'm getting into it. Well, I never had a summer job. No, summers were for fun. And my mother never even suggested that I get a summer job. And in fact, I felt sorry for any of my friends who had a summer job. I didn't need one. Not because we were rich, but because my mother gave me a weekly allowance just for existing. She gave me 50 bucks a week, not for doing anything. I never had to do chores. I never had to do wash or help clean the house. Even though she was a working mother and my grandmother was bedridden, I never had to do anything. I had no chores, no responsibilities, but I got money every Friday when my mom cashed her paycheck. I didn't have to spend that money on clothes. My mother bought my clothes. That money was just for fun. I used to save it up, and when we went to Wildwood once a week during the summer, I would spend it on the games and stuff and on souvenirs because that I had to pay for myself. But I never earned any of that money. My allowance was not an allowance. It was just a stipend for existing. Wow, you made it another week in this house. Here's 50 bucks. Have a good time. When it was time to go to college, I let my mother know. A lot of my friends were working to earn money for college or they were taking out student loans. I told my mother, I'm not paying for college. See, this was my thoughts. Even back then as a 17, 18 year old, I said, I want to go to college, but you're paying for it. And if you don't pay for it, I'm not going. And she kind of wanted me to go to college. So she paid for it. She took out a loan so I could go to college. But see, I didn't like college. <clears throat> didn't like it. Too much fending for myself. Actually, my mother in college opened up a checking account for me. And she would send me a check every week for $100 a week to put in my checking account to do whatever I wanted with. And I still didn't like college. <laughs> didn't like walking up and down seven flights of steps to get to my room. Didn't like classes. Didn't like taking classes. I mean, I just didn't like it. So I quit. Dropped out of college and came home. And I stayed home for a while and didn't work at all. Most parents would say, oh, you dropped out of college. Go get a job. Not my mom. She was just so happy that I wasn't five hours away anymore. And she could see and control everything I was doing every second of every day. She was just happy I was under her roof again. Under her control. See, this is where I had my mom. She wanted to control me. She didn't want me to be on my own or fend for myself or have my own apartment. She wanted to know where I was. She wanted to know what time I came home. She wanted to tuck me in bed at night at 18, 19, 20, 25, 30 years old. Yeah, that was my mother. And I knew it. And I used it. When I did get a full-time job, I did not pay room and board because if my mother said, oh, well, so-and-so is charging their kids room and board, I said, charge me room and board, I'll move out. If I'm going to pay rent here and pay for my food here, then that means I don't have to call you if I'm going to be out overnight. I don't have to let you know where I am every minute. I'm a tenant. And if I'm going to be paying room and board to live here with you, with one bathroom and very little privacy, I might as well have my own apartment. The room and board thing went away real quick. Oh, I'm not going to charge you room and board. This is your home. You stay as long as you want. 
never had to pay for food. I mean, my mom wasn't a cook, but she did go grocery shopping. I never did the grocery shopping. She did. She's the mother, right? I'm 20-something years old, but, you know, she wants me under her roof. She feels guilty about granny and everything. She doesn't want me to move out. So I spent my money on traveling. When I was 25, I had a serious health problem. I had an ectopic pregnancy. I almost died. And my health insurance from work paid for so much. Guess who paid the rest of the medical bills that the insurance didn't pay? My mother. I'm the one who got pregnant. Even though I was on birth control, I got pregnant. I messed up. She paid the medical bills. Because once again, my money that I earned working full-time was for fun. I had a trip planned the following year to go to the Caribbean. I can't afford medical bills, Mom. She paid for them. She paid for them. All I had to do was threaten to move out. Well, if I'm going to have to spend my money on such frivolous things as food and rent and medical bills, I might as well not live with you. Because living with you means you control me. Because I did. I would be going out with my friends, and if we decided to stay out late and go to a diner for breakfast at 2 or 3 in the morning, I was the only one who had to call home. I'm not coming home for a while. Here's where I am. Oh, my God. So embarrassing. But she was willing to let me be a perpetual adolescent so that she could control my every move and know everywhere I went and everywhere I was 24 hours a day. That's the kind of mother she was. I guess today she would be called a helicopter mom. I was 30 years old, 32 years old when I met my husband. And the night I met him at a bar and I went home with him, I had to call mommy. And he's looking at me like, what the hell? But I had to call mommy and I had to hear the lecture about what a horrible whore I am. And this guy could be an axe murderer. Yeah, that happened a lot when I was in my 20s. Old enough to be on my own, old enough to stay out overnight if I chose to, but still living with mommy, that perpetual adolescent who could still get in trouble if she stayed out too late at 32 years old. How sad for me. How sad for me. It wasn't my mother's fault. It was my fault in a way. It was both our faults. My mother was raised this way. Good Greek girls, good girls, lived under their parents' roof until they had a husband to take care of them. That was the way it was supposed to work. My mother never had a husband that took care of her, and she wanted me to find one. Just not in a bar, I guess. I don't know, because I actually did. The man I met that night in the bar when I had a call, and she called me a whore. Well, he's my husband. Love you, Jason, just in case you see this. But it just so happened I met my husband in a bar. She wanted me to meet my husband in church. That didn't work out. <clears throat> but after I met my husband, when I first met my husband, as I've told you many times, we were very, very poor. Very poor. I had 40 bucks a week to go to the grocery store. And you know what? I'll tell you what. For as perpetually adolescent that I was when I met my husband, I was a decent poor person. I was. I took that $40 and we had a hot meal on the table every night. We didn't go out to dinner. We didn't have the fancy cable channels. We didn't have HBO or Cinemax or Showtime or any of that crap. We were very frugal. Except that I knew all I had to do, and shoot, I lost one of my props. All I had to do was pick up, pretend this is a phone, and speed dial my mother. Oh, Mom, Jason and I really want to see Sopranos. Can we come over? Of course, baby, come over. I'll order dinner.
Every time my mom went to the grocery store when we were poor, she would come to my house before she went home with her groceries, with all this stuff that we couldn't afford to buy. When my teeth got bad and I needed a bridge, it was $3,000. I said, well, I can't afford it. I'm going to have them pulled. Mom said, don't worry, baby. I'll pay for them. And she paid for them because we couldn't afford it. We could not afford it. I was working two jobs. Jason was working two jobs. We were working. But we always had that mommy backup. We could call my mom for anything. Anything. Jason borrowed money from my mother. And she told him, pay it back whenever you feel like it. Now, to my husband's credit, he paid her back within three months. And every time he made a payment, you know what my mother would say to him? You know, you don't have to pay me this. Why don't you take my daughter out for a nice dinner instead? I don't need the money. That was my mom. Take care of my daughter. Poor thing, can't take care of herself. Because I couldn't. And I can't. That's the sad part. Because I was never forced to do anything to earn my allowance as a child. Never forced to work if I wanted a college education. Never forced to do anything that made me inconvenienced, like paying a medical bill before going on a vacation. Or maybe going out and finding a full-time job that had dental insurance so I could pay for my own bridge. Never learned to do that because I never had to. That's the point. And that's the problem. Not my mother's fault. She was guilty. She thought that she, I was her only child. She had the money. She wanted to make sure I was okay. And she loved my husband. Hun, I'm doing a show. <laughs> Sorry, my neighbor just came over. Um, so, and that is love. She loved me. But she did not teach me to be a self-reliant, independent woman. Because in her mind, a woman should be cared for by her husband. She didn't want me living alone in an apartment because she didn't want to think of me being completely free to do whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted, without her knowing about it. When my mother died in 2004, I had not worked full time at all. I hadn't worked at all for five years because my husband started his own company and was very successful, but he was self-employed. And that's always scary because you never know where your next paycheck is coming from. You have no benefits. You have to cover yourself, your own insurance, your own retirement, your own workman's comp, your own disability. You have to pay for everything. And when my mother died, even as much as I loved and trusted my husband, who I had been with for eight years, I was terrified. Now, my husband has turned out to be an amazing provider, a wonderful man. Very, very good man. He cares so much about making me happy, kind of like my mom did. But when I lost my mother, I thought, oh my God, what if we fail? What if Jason loses his business or loses a job? Who's going to help us? Who's going to take care of us? Wow. Wow. Why should I have thought that? I was almost 40 freaking years old when my mother died. My husband was 35 years old. And here I am, scared to death about, since my mother isn't around anymore, to speed dial. Who's going to take care of us if something goes wrong? Why would I not think, we're going to take care of us, of course. We're going to batten down the hatches. If we have to, we'll go back and we'll both work two jobs again. We'll fix it. We'll take care of us. Why was I so terrified? Because my mommy wasn't there to take care of us anymore. 
Is this how you guys want your children to be when they're 40 years old? And something, God forbid, happens to you? Oh, mommy and daddy are dead. Who's going to do my laundry? Who's going to take care of me if, if something goes wrong, if I lose my job? Where am I going to live? Do you really want to raise children who feel like that? I'm not proud that I feel like this. This is how I was raised. I was taught. Mommy will take care of you and then you will get married and hub's husband will take care of you. That was the way I was raised. And I so envy women like my friend Catherine, who's a lawyer, who takes care of herself and she has a wonderful husband and a wonderful family. But she can take care of herself with or without her husband. And she's raised her daughter to do the damn same thing. Good for her. And her daughter is a very independent and strong young woman because of her upbringing. The friend I talked about yesterday, Delaney, she's never going to have to rely on, rely on a man to take care of her. And even if her parents are gone, God forbid, she'll be okay. She can take care of herself. She's going to college. She's working hard. She's going to have a career. It's really terrifying as someone who is a perpetual adolescent to tell you what it feels like. And I'm saying this out loud to you because some of you still have a chance to make a difference, to change how you're raising your children, how your grandchildren are being raised by your children. Don't raise them to be people like me. Who sometimes lose sleep at night wondering what will happen to me if I don't have my husband to take care of me. If he gets disabled, if he loses his job, what's going to happen to me? How will I survive? Now, luckily, I've learned a lot since my mother died and in, since doing this show, actually, and doing research. I think I'll be just fine. I have learned that when times get tough, like down here, when the power went out in 2011 for 12 hours, I didn't, I was upset, but I didn't fret. I said, you know what? Let me go see if I can help my neighbors because some of them had damage. I think I handled that pretty well. I think when the times get tough, the adrenaline will get pumping and I will be okay. I have wonderful friends who can help me out with finding a job, finding a way to support myself. And that, believe me, is something I'm willing to do, <coughs> excuse me, to do if I have to. I only wish that I knew for a fact I had something to fall back on. Being a housewife is fine. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Choosing not to work because you have a spouse who can support you, whether you're a man or a woman, nothing to be ashamed of. But always have yourself to rely on. Always have yourself as your plan B. I mean, come on. Have a way to take care of yourself, to support yourself. To be self-reliant, to be resilient. That anything life throws at you, you can survive without anybody else's help. Not the nanny government. Not family members, be a burden on them. Not friends, on you. Have faith in you, as the Rachel Platten song goes. Have some fight in you. Because no matter how I was raised, I swear to God, and I pray to God, that I will have the strength that if something happens, I'll have the fight in me. Political Paula, out.